Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. A uh, particular welcome if this is your first time here. Uh, I am really excited to say that my guest today is the wonderful JR from Geek Chat One. If you don't know who he is, I will let him introduce himself. JR, do you want to say hi? Absolutely. Hey everybody out there in In Deep Geek Land. Uh, I'm JR from Geek Chat One, where we have a lot of chats about various geeky topics from all over the place. Uh, you can usually find me in the chat in the Facebook group or on channels and collaborating with all these awesome uh, content creators such as Robert and Kyle and Gemma and everybody else. So uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on again, Robert. Now, the honor is all mine. For those who do not know, so Geek Chat One, it's I think it's, I would say, primarily Facebook. There's a huge huge community going on on Facebook. You've also got the YouTube channel. Uh, it's a place that I go to hang out just to chat to other people who care about stuff like A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, uh, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars. It's not just one fandom. It's a lot of different fandoms coming together. So I would highly recommend you go, do go and uh, check out Geek Chat 1. But today what we're doing is we're going to be talking about House Lannister. Um, as we've moved past season eight now, uh, we're in a kind of a world where we're looking forward to what might happen in the books and also still a little bit of unraveling what happened uh, in the show. Uh, so we've got some questions as always from my patrons that's gonna kind of frame what we're gonna be talking about. If anything comes up in the chat, obviously we'll get to any super chats as soon as we can um, and uh, we'll just kind of see. But we're talking about House Lannister past, present, and future. Is it just me, guys, or is Robert cutting out? Um, guys, if, if I am, can you uh, let me know in the chat? Uh, I will keep on talking uh, on the assumption that I'm still going uh, okay. Um, uh, Maura Lee, thank you so much, saying just my usual uh, show of love and appreciation for the hard work, passion, and creativity you put into uh, in Deep Geek and the Well Told Tale. Can't wait for more of the Traveller's Guide and more on the Robert's Rebellion Tower of Joy series. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Traveller's Guide is uh, is back and we're in Bravos. I took a week off from that, but I've got a, I've got a couple of them recorded now and they're going to be now every Friday from now on. I've got a, probably another four episodes to do in Bravos, so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and also more is saying uh, some money for Robert, JR, Gemma and Kyle towards the drinking fund at Con of Thrones uh, 2019. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll talk about Con of Thrones a little bit later. I know JR, you've got something you want to talk about there as well. But let's Absolutely. get into House Lannister first of all. Um, I'll, I'll start with a, a sort of a, a general question to you, JR. What's your sort of overall view of the House Lannister? I mean, we talk about people with character arcs, but what's the House Lannister arc as far as you're concerned? Uh, well, historically, I'd really like it to tie somewhat back into House Lancaster, right? I mean, it's kind of <laughs> the model that George R. R. Martin used and, and based the house on, right? Um, I, I really like the House Lannister. It's an old house. It's a proud house and a very wealthy house. Uh, we're not exactly sure how everything came to be and how the Lannisters ended up in Castle Rock. Uh, I do suppose that'll be a mystery that we'll explore, hopefully in some of the uh, follow-on series that we're getting from HBO, whether it be Blood Moon or some of the others that are being speculated upon, right? Uh, I just enjoy the house because they are a powerhouse. They are one to contend with. And there's so many dynamic characters from history all the way through and then wondering where the future of the house is going to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I have to say, I, I do love House Lannister. Not, I mean, there are a lot of bad characters in there, but they produce some of the best characters. Tyrion, as I'm sure many of you know, is my favorite character, the character I like reading about the most. But also Jamie and Cersei, is, you can't really take, her, take your eyes off of her. But let's start going back in history and also uh, thinking a little bit about uh, the prequel. Uh, I had a question from Heike Durr, who was saying, Naomi Watts was cast for the Game of Thrones prequel as, uh, quotes, a charismatic socialite hiding a dark secret. Yeah, so this is the spin-off that we're going to get probably in about a year, assuming they uh, green light it after the... The, the uh, follow-on series, because George R. R. Martin mislikes the term spin-off. Well, I mean, I, 
Far be it from me to, to contradict George R. R. Martin, but I, I think that's tomato, tomato. Um, it's, oh. it's a spin-off. Uh, and and it's it's a prequel and it's going back to the uh, the the age of heroes and so we've got this character Naomi Watts as a charismatic socialite hiding a dark secret could she be a lamb the clever character um now i'll throw this one to you jr so first of all at a high level who was lamb the clever and then secondly, do you think that Naomi Watts might be this Lan the Clever? So it, it's really interesting. And I I really hope that it is. So Land, going back in the, the ancient history, right? Okay, so Lan the Clever is, is one of these legendary household figures, right? I mean, he's a he's the same, uh he's the Lannister version of Bran the Builder, right? He's the he's he or she will say that. Uh they're legendary, right? So the they're King Arthur. They are, you know, bigger than life characters. Um, legends kind of have their own way of forming around these. And we don't know for sure anything about Land the Clever. And we don't know anything really concrete for sure of what brand Stark, because there's so many of them, what Brandon Stark built the wall, built Storm's End, built Winterfell. Is it possible that they could do that all in one lifetime, given the, the grand scale of all of them? Uh, so there's a lot of questions that come up with it, and there is a possibility that Lan the Clever could be a female, and that the legend, as it spiraled through history, became that it was a male. But it's very possible that Na Naomi Watts' character could be Lan the Clever. Yeah, so, so Lan the Clever is the founder, effectively, as you're saying, of House Lannister. And this is where, if you've ever wondered why... Casterly Rock is called Casterly Rock, not Lannister Rock or anything like that. It's because it used to be owned by uh, House Casterly. And then Lan the Clever, there's lots of different variations on the legend of Lan the Clever. But Lan the Clever basically managed to trick them out of it and then started House Lannister. So that's that's the kind of the where this all came from. And we don't know the exact timings, but if this is going back to the Age of Heroes, then we get a lot of these characters like Bran the Builder, like um, uh, potentially even Azora High, the last hero, Land the Clever. They're all going to be appearing around this time. I think it's entirely likely that we will have a progenitor of House Lannister in this spin-off if they allow it to go, uh, go along that far. Um, I think that they will want to have enough links across to the main series that people understand a little bit of it. The 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 thing about Lan the Clever is that he is this, uh, or she is this um, model for Tyrion. George R. R. Martin likes to use this the, a character in Legend who's a lot like a character in the present day, and Tyrion is kind of like Lan the Clever. So um, while we're, I mean, just just on this, Jr. Have you got any other thoughts about the the, the pre? I know it's filming at the moment, um, or the the pilot at least. Um, have you got any thoughts? Do you think that we are going to see all of these different houses or, or the progenitors of these different houses in the show, or is it going to be a complete new start? I, I think they have to make a bridge between the the main series that just ended and and the prequels. And I think the easiest way to do that is to identify with the houses. And we luckily we know that all of these houses are very ancient houses, old houses. Um, you know, the Stark Starks obviously being one of the oldest houses, Lannister being one of the oldest houses. The Baratheons and Targaryens are kind of newcomer ish in Westerosi terms, right? Because you had Aegon the Conqueror, and the Baratheons kind of came into power at the same time uh, over the Stormlands. I mean, not to say that the Baratheons weren't there, they were obviously there, but uh, as far as controlling the Stormlands, it, it happened a little bit later than, say, uh, House Stark or House Lannister, right? All these pop up kings. Uh, that ruled over their little areas, uh, kind of controlled it, and then Baratheon became the dominant house, especially after uh, Aegon's conquering, uh, and they married into the family. There's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happened. So I think we're going to see a lot of the beginnings of these houses, and we'll be introduced to houses that are no longer there anymore. So maybe we'll get some callbacks to like House Rain, 
uh, House Gardner, houses that ended up going extinct over the course of the story, which would be a, you know, a really unique story to be able to tell that and introduce all these great characters, ultimately to kill them all off in you know, George R. R. Martin's favorite thing to do, right? Yeah, and this is the the glory of having stuff set 8,000 years ago is that we know they're all going to die at some point. It's just right. a matter of how these characters are going to die. Uh, Andrew Kay in the chat, I noticed, saying, uh, let's hope George R. R. Martin is closely involved in an advisory role. As I understand it, he is very closely involved. This is Jane Goldman is the showrunner here. Jane Goldman is incredibly talented, if you've ever seen her, the other stuff that she's done. Uh, yeah. But uh, George R. R. Martin has said that he has been very involved in developing this and some of the other spin-offs that they're working up as well. So, uh, yeah, it's it should be staying true to what George R. R. Martin's vision is. But, uh, and you were saying about this being legend, I think this is really important, is that um, George R. R. Martin talked about all of these characters, the Age of Heroes, in a legendary, mythical way. He wasn't ever saying that the legends that he wrote were exactly what happened. In fact, they probably weren't. So that allows quite a lot of leeway for a story to be sort of uh, woven through there and, and actually to, uh, to trick us in ways that we might not expect. And uh, is Land the Cleverer Woman is exactly the kind of thing that we might find happens a lot, is that our assumptions are that Lana the Clever was a man, so maybe actually it's uh, it's a woman. But let's, really, uh, it becomes a question of how much, how much do we actually know about legend? And, and, you know, he keeps illustrating throughout different texts, like A World of Ice and Fire or uh, Fire and Blood, right? That, you know, the narrative that we know from the maesters may not actually be the truth because they're still writing stuff that was passed from oral tradition and back and forth. And it, it just creates this whole world that, you know, we can kind of assume that not all of it is true, that it is legend, that it was built up to be something bigger than it was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, I don't know whether it's going to be some built up to be something bigger than it was. I think it was massive. And I think as far as I'm concerned, what happened in the age of heroes, the first long night, was so important that it sparked lots of different legends and that then you get the legends that happened all the way over in Essos and that's where we get the Azora High stuff coming down, the last hero in Westeros. And so that, I think, is the way that it works. It, it clearly was a seismic event and this sparked lots of different legends that subtly changed over time according to the kind of context of the people who were telling and retelling and retelling the stories. So that's where uh, the where I see it. Um, Clark and Tacos uh, saying, please discuss Eris and Tywin's history together and the Joanna uh, relation, not to mention which of Tywin's kids might be heiresses. So this is a, a question which, uh, comes up quite a lot, which is based upon the idea that we get lots of hints and rumours uh, in not just in A Song of Ice and Fire, but sort of the, uh, the attached kind of uh, things that George R. R. Martin has done, like the World of Ice and Fire and things like that, that hint that Ares II, uh, at the very least, had a massive crush on Joanna, the woman that Tywin Lannister uh, married and was the mother of his children. And uh, he also, at the very least, uh, was uh, guilty of uh, what I suspect we would now call inappropriate touching. Um, and so the question is, did he go further? Might any of the Lannister children actually be his? So what's your take on this, JR? Do you think that there's a chance that any of the three Lannister children, Cersei, Jaime, and Tyrion, might actually secretly be half Targaryen. I, I, there is a possibility. I, I don't know if I, I don't think I could put a number on it. I, I think there's certain things and there's certainly historical cause to kind of wonder why Joanna Lannister was dismissed from court in the manner that she was. Uh, she was dismissed ultimately from the Red Keep and from the high society of Targaryens by Aerys true wife uh, and sister. And this had happened throughout history of Eris's court, right? Uh, as soon as somebody was assumed to have a relationship 
deemed as inappropriate, they were immediately expelled from court at King's Landing, right? And so this ended up happening with Joanna Lannister as well, uh, which is really odd because she was a, a lady in waiting inside of the court, inside of King's Landing. Uh, she was a socialite, right? Uh, very well known, very well liked and loved, and was dismissed in the same manner as people who were kind of described as harlots or trying to usurp their position or upstart their position by sleeping with Targaryens, ultimately, right? Uh, so in the manner that she was dismissed, it raises enough questions for me to go plausible and, and put it on the checkmark list, right? It, it's it's plausible for me. Yeah, I, th I think... So, so technically, it could have been the case. Uh, there, there were opportunities for him to be the father of either the twins or of Tyrion. Um, now, of them, the what George R. R. Martin has done has given us little hints. Now, with Jamie, there's not really all that much of a kind of like a Targaryen feel to him. But Cersei undoubtedly, and they played up on this, I think, in the show, Cersei undoubtedly has some kind of echoes of the Mad King with burning things down with wildfire and the like. So there's a certain hint there uh, that, that she's echoing him. And Tyrion, they did not play this up at all, really, in, on the show, but Tyrion... Um, we get lots of hints, to be fair, lots of hints that perhaps there's something slightly more Valyrian about him that might that might first meet the eye. There, he has dragon dreams, which is what Targaryens are supposed to have. He, when he was a child, he asked for a dragon because uh, that's what he wanted was to have a dragon. Um, there's the uh, on the show we saw the fact that he seems to be able to approach a dragon when he was down in Marine under the underground. He approached a dragon and they seemed to sniff him and be sort of okay with him. In the same way they kind of sniffed John and seemed to be okay with him. There's the echo between John and Danny and uh, Tyrion about the their they all lost their mothers in childbirth. They both all grew up. Um, uh, sort of in the shadow of a, a sort of a, a strong father, whether that father was there or not, but actually effectively were orphan children. So there's lots of these echoes. I haven't got time to go into all of it. There's lots of these hints that Tyrion might have something more to his backstory. And, and I have to say... No, go, go. Give me the... Give me uh, the conversely. Conversely, there, there's also a lot of echoes that are, go the opposite way, right? Because... Uh, Tyrion being that he is the imp and sort of sent to scorn Tywin, right? Because of Tywin's pride and he's got to watch him waddle around. And the irony that we know that George loves to lay on to things and being, it would be ironic if Tyrion was actually Tywin's true born son and the twins weren't. So there's a lot of other things that play on the other side that make you question maybe it might be the other way around and that Tyrion is actually the true-born son of Tywin and the twins uh, are actually Targaryen. So the way that George layers it, I mean, it just leads to nothing but speculation, which is ultimately the, the best part about this series, isn't it? It is. And, and I have to say, I've said this before, this is the one kind of slightly tinfoily theory that I waver on the most. Some days I, I, I think, actually, yeah, there's so much evidence in favour of this. Some days I go, well, no, as you say, that it makes so much more narrative sense for him to be uh, actually the, his father's son and, and the, the irony there is huge. Um, I have come to the conclusion that we are never going to know because we're never going to go back in time and actually see, you know, who the true father is, where there's always going to be that element of doubt and we're going to be left with it. I think that is the way that George R. R. Martin likes to play with this. He isn't actually about giving us hard and fast answers on things. Um, but uh, talking about things that are slightly vague, Nine Nichols, thank you so much for the uh, the super chat. Uh, you said, uh, uh, and it's not Nine Nichols that's slightly vague, it's, the, uh, it's what the, the, the question is about Jamie's weirwood dream saying, is Jamie's weirwood dream foreshadowing for his encounter with Lady Stoneheart? Uh, how will him and Brienne get out of the situation? Will it be a trial? So uh, for those, uh, this is very much a 
book question because this wasn't on the show. Um, for those who are unaware, Jamie had, uh, he slept one night with his head on a, a stump of a weirwood tree and he had this uh, vision dream, which was very big and complicated. And there are so many things going on in it that, that it would take an entire episode of, of me talking to unpack it. Um, one of the elements there is that he has stood next to Brienne, and this is kind of what prompts him to go back to sort of save Brienne. Uh, and he sort of stood there with her and they're both holding swords and all the rest of it. Um, is it foreshadowing for how uh, his encounter with Lady Stoneheart will sort of play out? Uh, potentially, it's also working through his whole the Rhaegar and the other the other members of the Kingsguard all appear in this vision as well, and he's down underground under Casterly Rock, and uh, and and there's a lot of his own guilt going on. This, for me, the primary thing here about this vision is actually not so much a, a sort of a foreshadowing of what might come, but a turning point in terms of Jamie for where his story is going or where his heart is going, because it is the point at which he is starting to be faced with the accusatory figures uh, telling him of all the things that he has done wrong in the past, and he's seeing who is actually truly standing by his side being Brienne. So, for me, that is the main point of what's going on there. It is a weirwood vision, which means that we shouldn't necessarily take it as being a, uh, this is exactly what's about to happen. It could have been planted there by someone, if in doubt, blame Blood Raven. Uh, and why is it that he might want to do that? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but it certainly pushed Jamie to be going back to collect Brienne. Uh, and uh, we know that Bran was certainly very happy to have Jamie uh, back on board back in Winterfell in the show. So um, uh, I don't think it's a matter of foreshadowing. That Yes, I think there probably is an element of foreshadowing, but I don't think the main focus of this is the foreshadowing. I think it's the turning point in Jamie's um, arc, and we'll come on to Jamie's arc in a lot more detail later, but I think it's the turning point in the books, his arc, and for where he is away from all the accusatory figures of his past, and towards who are the people who actually will stand by the true him. Uh, but did you, JR, did you have any thoughts on that one that you want to sort of add to uh, that? Uh, yeah, we're going to uh, just try this to see how this works. Um, yeah, so what we have going is a manifestation in a dream of survivor's guilt and of uh, PTSD coming to the forefront, failure of duty. There's a lot of things that are going on in this dreams, and it certainly is the separation from his Lannister identity into being the knight that he should be, right? Uh, that's kind of what happens throughout the entire dream. Uh, Tywin, Cersei, Joffrey, they all kind of leave his side in the dream. And, you know, he even asks, like, give me a sword as, as the light is departing and Cersei's the last one to leave them down uh, in the catacombs of Castle Rock. Uh, and he... he in the dream, he, he learns that Brienne is going to stay by his side, and, which is very, very much foreshadowing for what is about to transpire in the books, because he is going with Brienne ultimately to lead, to meet Lady Stoneheart. And the last word that we have from Brienne's mouth is sword. What we assume is sword of choosing the sword or the, or the rope. Uh, there's a, I can't wait to see what happens in the books. And I know we keep saying this over and over since the season ended, but I cannot wait. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So, J Jamie, she does survive. Brienne, we know this, uh, but um, we don't know all the ins and outs of it. And Lady Stoneheart is, I think, one of the pivotal characters in the books that they took out, and I think they've given part of her story to other characters in the show. So one thing I'm reasonably certain on is that a lot of Arya's revenge missions in the Riverlands on the show going after the phrase and so on, actually that's going to be Lady Stoneheart's work in the books. So I think that we're going to see Aya probably stay a little bit longer in Bravos and then maybe head straight back up to uh, Winterfell uh, uh, rather than having all this going around in the Riverlands uh, business. So that's where I see that one going. Um, let's go to a question from James Sidney. 
uh, about, uh, do you give any credence to the Geryon Lannister being the shrouded lord theory? Uh, Tyrion sees him, albeit in a dream, as resembling his father, and allegedly will spare anyone who make him laugh. Uh, furthermore, the shy maid going back in time events seems to happen only after Tyrion admits to his Lannister heritage out loud. Um, right, so this is, this is, again, very much a book thing. Now, this is, if you remember on the show, when you get Tyrion with uh, Sir Jorah and then the boat and they go through, I think they made it old Valyria. Uh, but in in the in the books, they're going through uh, the Sorrows, which is this area uh, with the Rhoyne River, uh, where there is this curse that has been there for a long time after some massive uh, magic was attempted hundreds of years ago in a way to try and uh, push back the Valyrians. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, what was left there was these kind of what the stone people, which is effectively the people who've been uh, affected by grayscale seriously. And the leader of these people is this shrouded lord. Now, so that's half of this. Uh, for those who don't know who Geryon Lannister is, Geryon Lannister is Tyrion's uncle. So this is Tywin's little brother, who basically everyone seemed to love, apart from Tywin, probably. Uh, but Tyrion thinks of him as his favourite uncle. So does uh, Jaime. He seemed to laugh lots. He seemed to care about the Lannisters. Uh, and he went off to try and find the lost Lannister Valyrian steel sword, which was in last scene heading towards old valeria so right roar yes trying to recover the ancestral blade of house lannister to be the hero of house lannister and we have absolutely zero idea what happened to him exactly so the last we know is that we saw he was seen i think it was in volantis um and half of his sailors suddenly went you want us to go where and they, they just scarpered and so he then had to take on board some slaves in order to get him to where he was wanting to go. So we can assume that he ended up going to where he said he was going to go. Now, that is quite a long way east from uh, the River Rhoyne uh, and the Sorrows. So my guess is that uh, actually, no, this isn't Geryon. Um, I think that... Geryon probably just died in old Valyria, um, the smoking sea, like everybody who goes over there seems to, uh, in kind of miserable and horrible ways. He went there and he never came back, and I think that is probably except for Euron. Euron can survive everything. Well, allegedly so. Yes, uh, allegedly. What, what what would you what what's your take then on Geryon? Do you think that he did survive, or do you think he just went there and died? Um, I, oh, I forgot. I got to do that again. Um, so I, 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 I'm with you on this one. I don't think he survived. It would, it would be neat if it was him and somehow the magic of ultimately what is kind of the, the Westerosi version or the, the known world version of nuclear fallout. It would be kind of cool if somehow that preserved him in, in some shape or form but i just don't see them as crossing paths i don't i don't see it as being terribly plausible yeah and i think so i i think that we we get Geryon. he if he went all the way over to the smoking sea i don't think he then turned around and became um the leader of the stone men that doesn't make sense the the shy maid thing i don't think i'm going to go into it in detail here but for those who don't know it's one of the weirdest incidents in the books um that uh we uh and given the fact that this is a book with series of books with dragons and zombies and all the rest of it this was what appeared to be on the face of it a little bit of a mini time loop that happened uh, and George R. R. Martin wrote it very clearly. Uh, the Tyrion was going in in the boat under a bridge. They get past the bridge. Uh, they start chatting about a few things and then suddenly says, hey, there's that bridge again. And then they have to go back under the bridge and then some bad stuff happens. And it's just like, a, wait, where, why, what? 
And it's very confusing and there's no clear explanation. It might have just been that the, the currents of the, the river are a little bit weird and just brought them back around again and they just didn't weren't paying attention. Or it may be that there was some deep magic. This is a place which is uh, shrouded, pun intended, shrouded in magic. Uh, so it's possible that that was going on. Uh, but I would highly recommend you go and uh, and look at that section again if you want a real mystery in, in, in the world of ice and fire. Um, let's go to, um, to, 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 to let's talk about Tisha. Um, so J I will throw this one to you, Jr. Uh, so so for Tisha, for those who do not know, is uh, Tyrion's first wife let's call her that there was the whole backstory about the fact that he uh sort of fell deeply and madly in love with her and then it turns out this was just like uh jamie sort of setting it all up and then tywin discovered and horrible things happened basically and then she was disappeared by tywin or she went ran off or she went uh so what uh, the the question this is a james sydney question um, the question is, uh, is there any chance that we'll see Tisha in future books? Uh, and Nic Nicole Stewart asked the same thing. Do you think that Tisha will be revealed in the book? So what do you reckon, JR? Do you think we will see her again? I think it's possible that we'll see her again, although I don't know if George does it, that I will like it or agree with it. it it's... It's meant to be, we don't have to have closure on all the things that happen in history through our main characters, right? But we need to understand why and how they are what they are, right? We need to have an understanding of the history. And this is part of his history and his backstory and the reason that he trusts or mistrusts people. I mean, a lot of this all stems around it. And this is where his hatred for his father truly resides in. Um, there's some speculation that she might have already appeared, though she goes by a different name. Uh, I I just I don't know that I I would like it. I we'll see. I I don't think it's plausible though. I I just for me I really hope it's not. I think I think it needs to just be the the story that is part of the reason for Kyrian being the way that he is. Yeah, I mean I think I I may disagree a little bit on this one. I I say, incidentally I see the chatter saying that they always pronounce it Taisha to make it sound like a Taisha more. Uh, yeah. Lannister name. I, I'll probably still go with Tisha on the grounds that George R. R. Martin told us that we can pronounce the names however we want to. Uh, so uh, Tisha is, um, or Flungle uh, is, um, uh, she she um, departed with a large amount of money. This was a cruel thing that uh, Tywin did, but she ended up leaving with a lot of money. So she could have gone wherever she wanted to go, and. I like the theory that she is um, this woman who is known as the sailor's wife in Bravos. Now, the sailor's wife is uh, this uh, whore, or whore, as, uh, as I'm sure that uh, Charles Dance would say, um, who, is, uh, who will sleep with people for money, but only after they have uh, married her um, uh, in some kind of like a faux ceremony. Now, uh, what... Uh, this immediately makes you go, okay, so that's quite you know, a, a weird little quirk that this person has uh, linked to being married to somebody. Um, then we find out that she speaks fluent Westerosi, common tongue. Uh, then we find out that she also has um, a, a daughter who is of roughly the age that she should have been if she were Tyrion's daughter, whose name is Lana, which sounds mysteriously like Lannister. So none of these things are like foolproof. They're, none of them are, are very solid, but they kind of work. The reason why I think it's possible, George R. R. Martin says that we will learn a bit more about her in the later books. And um, this is actually, they they completely expunged it from the show, but this is the thing that actually has been running through Tyrion's mind the most in the last book or so that we've had. Because the the question that he asks Tywin when he shoots him is, you know, well, where did Tisha go? What, what happened to her? Uh, and Tywin just says, 
where, where you yeah, know wherever whores go uh which is clearly just like a dismissive term that he, the amount of times that Tyrion thinks in his pov chapters that where do whores go that's what seems to be what he's trying to work his way through as he's going through essos where do they go and the answer presumably is to a whorehouse that is a brothel that is where she would go she wasn't at the time that was basically what the the, the irony there is and tywin has basically given her the money and set her up and made her that uh, that person uh, so it's kind of dark but it does need some resolution in the books because this is the major thing that is running through Tyrion's mind at the moment is this last thing that his father said to him but well how do you think to that theory jr i uh, the Sailor's Wife theory is intriguing, and it, it, it certainly is possible, uh, plausible. Um, I, I I don't know. I, I I would like it to be one of those mysteries and just kind of leave it out there, so that we got to have a couple of them, right? That are kind of choose your own, right? Just just something. We're going to get resolution on a lot of other stuff, but maybe we can leave a couple of questions out there so that we'll debate about this for forty years, like you know we're going to anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've got fake Aya in the chat just saying, I like the sailor's wife as Gerion's widow, and Lana was his daughter. Again, the timing could sort of work for that as well. So, uh, yeah, I agree. It's the, the, There's there's something going on with the sailor's widow, uh, so the sailor's wife. So, um, and hopefully we'll find out a little bit more. Um, well, oh, and while I'm looking in the chat, Jamie McKenna saying, uh, when can we expect the new traveler's guide need my fix? Uh, tomorrow, I hope. Uh, as long as I get a chance uh, after this, I'm going to do, I'm going to record it and hopefully get it out for tomorrow. So that's a, a quick one to answer. Um, but we, uh, let's take this moment as we're taking a quick break. And uh, Maura Lee was talking earlier. Um, thank you again, Maura, for the very generous super chat about uh, Con of Thrones. So, so JR and I will both be at Con of Thrones. Uh, JR, I know that you're sort of, I don't know whether you consider yourself, but fronting up the campaign uh, to get one of the legends of, uh, of Game of Thrones to Con of Thrones. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about what that is and how people might be able to help? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Robert. Um, if you guys don't know, there's a huge effort going on right now to get uh, Andy the Extra and Lord Commander Bobby and First Ranger Hammer to Con of Thrones 2019. Uh, there's, there's some stuff going on behind the scenes. Basically, what's going on is we've started a GoFundMe to get them all here. Uh, we They were kind enough to come on to Geek Chat 1 on my channel, and we had a great conversation with them on... Man, what was that earlier this week now? I can't even remember when it was. Um, Monday, maybe? And it was absolutely amazing. It, they had a great time. We loved having them on. We had a great conversation. Absolutely hysterical stories. And so if you guys can find the, the GoFundMe for the Wolf and the Crows to help get them to Con of Thrones 2019, where we can talk to them in person and engage with them. I mean, these guys were really the darlings of season eight, weren't they? I mean, they, these guys... It, it, absolutely made it for me uh so we would really love some help and support on that um we will be on kyle's channel on sunday at three eastern with them again so be on the lookout for that that's on channel azor hype at three which is right after geek and news on geek chat one so we'll be going straight away into that yeah excellent i think this is as far as i'm concerned this is a chance for us as a Game of Thrones community to show our appreciation for all of those people who put in huge amounts of work behind the scenes on Game of Thrones. There were a number of different views on season eight and the, the, the story and all the rest of it, but I think one thing that everybody united behind was the astonishing work about by so many people there. And if you watched that uh, documentary, if you haven't incidentally watched the documentary, um, uh, The Last Watch, which uh, HBO produced about the creation of Game of Thrones, I'd highly recommend it because it's excellent. But the star of it was this guy called Andy, who was an extra who uh, was part of the stock uh, army all the way through pretty much the show and he's just there in the background just uh, and he so loved it and this is an opportunity for us 
just to show our appreciation of you just throw a, 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 a few dollars or a few a few pounds at it that that would be very much appreciated but uh, as, as we're sort of uh, as I'm throwing the over to you uh, JR what, what else is going on on Geek Chat One generally? Uh, well, tomorrow we're going to have Gina Miller, who's uh, basically the spearhead of getting Andy and Hammer and Bobby over for Conneth Run. She's the one that set up the GoFundMe, and I've been working with her and helping her uh, accomplish all this. But she's going to be on tomorrow night, and we're doing How to Con of Thrones Nightlife Edition. So this is going to be about Con of Thrones and all the nightlife events that are going on, being put on by content creators and other groups inside that are involved with Con of Thrones. And these are non-con official events, so you won't find them anywhere else, but we happen to have the ins, and we know the secrets and the people that are behind all of these things. So uh, we're going to give you a guide on what's going on, what days, and where to be, and who to be seen with, and how to find everybody else. And that's what we're going to cover tomorrow, along with cosplay. A lot of people have had cosplay concerns and questions, and so to, to settle all this uh up right before we're three weeks from Con of Thrones 2019 in Nashville now, and we have the head of cosplay judging and um, I've lost my train of thought. Amy Michelle is who's coming on the show as well, so she's going to answer all of your cosplay questions and where to check in your costumes out, what day to do it, and the like. So we've got a lot of stuff going on on, on different channels, and we're still trying to get content done for everything else in between. And still producing content for our, our panels, Robert, that we have uh, quite a few of, don't we? We have, yeah. So I will probably uh, let people know exactly which panels I'm doing slightly nearer the time. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a series of panels. I think I'm doing four or five of them, actually. Uh, panel discussions, each about 50 minutes long on a variety of different topics. Uh, but guys, yeah, please do uh, go and check out uh, the GoFundMe. There's a link if you're, of, if you're watching live in the, uh, the chat now. Um, and also please do check out Geek Chat 1. Okay, let's get back to House Lannister. Um, we've had quite a few questions uh, from my patrons about uh, Jamie and Cersei. So Nicole Stewart says, will Cersei and Jamie's ending on the show be the same in the books? Um, I personally don't think so based on where their arcs are, but wanted to get your perspective. CDW says, you mentioned in your live scenes you didn't like how Jamie's character arc ended. Uh, in season eight. And Maura Lee uh, says many were disappointed with Jamie's character arc and how it ended in the show. Um, do you, so Jay, I'll sort of throw this to you as a sort of a general, do you think that Jamie and Cersei's arcs will be the same in the books, as in will they end up dying in the same way in the books as on the show, or is it going to be different? Absolutely not. It's going to be completely different. Uh, I've got a couple of different theories swirling around in my head about what's going to happen, but I do not think that they are going to get crushed by stone. I, I, I don't think lions of Castile Rock get beat by a rock. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, what do you think might happen for them? So take Jamie, for example. Do you think that uh, his... So in the show... He seemed to be going on this redemption arc that he seems to be going on in the books as well and then turned it around at the last minute effectively. Do you think that's going to happen in the in the books as well? Uh, no, I think he's on a complete redemption arc in the book. And I, a lot of people say, well, no, that's Theon's um, re redemption arc. And he, you know, he's going to be the one that's going to be the redemptive character. And I understand what people are saying, and I agree, but I don't think we have to have only one character that's on a redemption arc, right? Uh, I mean, uh, both characters have done some pretty horrible things, and they've come to atone for their sins, and they're moving on and, and past that. Uh, personally, I really hope it doesn't go down like that at a whole. I really don't want Jamie to go back to Cersei in any way, shape, or form. Um, and the reason behind it and the reason that I was so adamant against what happened in the show uh, is because I've used Jamie as a character talking to other veterans uh, about, you know, just because we've done things in the past doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to continue to do those things. And making it a character that they can associate to and, and find 
the redemption story in there to find the redemption story in their self that you can do things going forward. Right. So I have, I resonate with Jamie's character for a, a myriad of reasons. And that's a really big one is because I've used it as a catalyst to helping other veterans uh, work through their own problems and, and with PTSD and trauma and, and how it affects you uh, long-term. So I really hope it doesn't happen like that in the, in the book. I really, really don't. Yeah. I mean, so, so I, I, I've sort of ummed and about that. I didn't like the way it ended on the show. Uh, I didn't like the just dying in the rubble thing. That didn't work for me. The thing that I disliked the most, I have to say, was Jamie's kind of throwaway line about, I never really cared about the people anyway. Uh, that seems to be rewriting his history. Um, the, the, the Brienne thing, I do wonder whether... Uh, this is something that season eight was guilty of uh, a number of things. One of them was rushing a lot of storylines. And what that meant is that we didn't actually get the natural feel of particularly a few key relationships. The, the, the one which shone out for most people, shone out's probably the wrong phrase, but John and Daenerys, we, the, their relationship was crucial to the entire season the strength of their relationship was crucial to the entire season but actually we only ever saw them together as a couple for like two or three scenes in total they got together at the end of season seven uh the the end of uh episode one of season eight john had learned about his true parentage and things weren't normal again from that point onwards so we only ever really saw like a handful of scenes of the two of them together as a couple, which meant that we couldn't buy into their story of them as a couple uh, hugely. And I think that with Jamie and Brienne, it was quite a similar thing, which is that actually it wasn't apparent at all from uh, the, the way they put it across. Actually, they set up home together. They were with each other for a, a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months. Um, this wasn't, like a one night thing this I mean, yes it wasn't a sort of a, a a hugely long term thing but it also just wasn't a one night thing for them they did actually commit to each other in a way uh, and set up home together so we just did not see that now the the bit that does feel a bit george r r martin about it is the way that uh nikolai kostovalda has tried to explain it after the event, which is that uh, Jamie had gone on this huge kind of redemption arc, and yet at the end of it, he was just a fallible human, and he was addicted to Cersei, and he just got dragged back. That I kind of understood. They just did not allow it to play out in time. So um, that's the sort of the first half of it. I'll, I'll come to your thoughts again on this in just one second, JR. The second bit with the how they die, I still buy in with this idea of Jamie being the most likely person to be the Valon Carr. Uh, I, that kind of works for me of him killing her in a kind of an, uh, an echo to save the city in the same way that he saved the city by killing the Mad King that really still works and resonates for me the idea that they just like stand there while rubble falls on them it seems a very kind of like uh, not poetic enough ending for two hugely important characters uh but but what what do you think on that do you think that the if we'd had a bit more time and pacing for that jamie brienne relationship it might have felt different if if they had enough time to do it and, and work it, yeah, maybe it would have would have played a little bit better. Uh, but the way it was rushed, I I understand why people went. What what is going on? I don't like it. I don't get it. I, I don't understand it, and I don't blame people at all for it because sometimes I question whether I understand it. Right? I mean, it worked certainly not fallible, and it didn't really work for me. It was clunky. It was pretty um bad and i i do have a dog in the fight like i said previously i i don't want it to happen at all in the book so of course i'm judging it with those eyes and i completely know that um so no uh as to who is going to be the valent car uh which is something they didn't really play on in the show right um 
I think Jamie could be the Valon car. I think Tyrion could be the Valon car, although the obvious choice is probably least likely on the list. So I don't think it's going to be Tyrion. I do play around with the possibilities of other people, or as some people have mentioned in the chat, and I'm sorry I didn't catch your names. I should have paid more attention to who said it. Um, but one that I've always liked is that uh, so she gets choked out with the chain of the hand. Um because it's not a pin in the books, it's actually a necklace, and Tyrion famously uses it to kill Shay. So uh, there's a lot of possibilities on who it could be, how it could be done. Um, is Valencar going to be, is it male or female derivative specific, specifically in High Valerian? We don't know. Uh, that is something else that we get to play with. So could it be a little brother or a little sister, or is it in High Valerian? Is Valencar actually just a little brother? or brother, period. I, so there's so many variables with the theory that go on right now. It, I, I love that we're still speculating about it and still trying to figure it out, right? It, it's half the fun of this. And we're we're taking scientific wild ass guesses at this, right? We, we have sort of some some knowledge base of how George R. R. Martin does things and writes things and the foreshadowing. And, and, you know, we're taking educated guesses at this is what we're doing, right? So we don't know if we're right or wrong in this. Uh, we are doing our best to put it together and sleuth through the material. So anybody's theory at this point is just as valid as another, right? Uh, I, I don't go with anybody's theory is just as valid. It depends on the theory. Uh, but uh, the, there are some some people I think would not be the Valencar. Just picking up on KCC saying, could Euron be the Valencar? Uh, I... I hadn't ever really considered the thought I had gray area. This is about six months ago. Gray area came on the channel and talked through the idea of Euron being the Valencar. If you're interested in that, uh, I'm sure if you Google for is Euron the Valencar in Deep Geek or something like that, it will come up. So uh, it's, it's somewhere there on my channel. Um, and uh, someone else was saying there will be a Valencar in the books. I think the thing I would pick up on here is that uh, George R. R. Martin is very much a writer who cares about the impact of prophecy on how people act, not so much about the outcome of whether the prophecy is true. So as far as he's concerned, the most important and interesting thing about this is the fact that Cersei is, starts to obsess about who the Valonqar might be obsess about the fact that it might be Tyrion and that starts to change how she acts. That is the important point as far as George R. R. Martin is concerned, rather than is there truth in the in the Belencar prophecy. And it doesn't start her mental decay, right? I mean this is this is part of what could yeah. start leading to the, the bad queen idea, right? That, that that starts her mental decay because she's spiraling, knowing that she's getting close to the end of her life. Because right now Toman's still alive, right now Marcella's still alive and, and all's well and good. And we don't know how they're gonna meet their end yet. Um, but what happens when that happens? What happens when she loses the other two children, right? And the, the sort of descent into chaos that's going to happen. And the whole Fagon side of the story coming into it. Who just said that in the chat? I am so sorry. I should have caught up with it. And I didn't. I think it was Bernie. I, I want to say it was Bernie. I really hope it was. Um, mentioned, um, you know, Fagon is going to be coming in to King's Landing. And I think Cersei's going to be gone before that. And I actually agree. I think Cersei's character took on the Fagon story, and that's why the Golden Company was with her, and ultimately amounted to absolutely nothing in the show. But I think Fagon is going to unseat Cersei uh, in uh, in the Crownlands. I, I I don't see Cersei holding on to the Red Keep. I think Danny is going to have to face the Fake Dragon in King's Landing when that comes to that point in the story arc. But I think Cersei's demise is going to end up being. Uh, handed to her by Fagon or by her doing something incredibly stupid because she's not the tactician that she thinks she is. Yeah, I think I would agree with that completely in, in terms of an analysis of what's happening with Fagon, I think, and what will happen with Danny. We've got one invasion which has already happened, which is the Fagon invasion. We've got a second invasion which is going to happen at some point, which is going to be the Danny invasion. I think that Cersei will probably join forces with Euron, but not from a position of strength, uh, more from a position of weakness. Uh, so I think that is the way that that's going to go. And, and incidentally, I think that is probably more likely to be the point at which Danny 
does the things to King's Landing that she does rather than uh, later on. I think that they've just shifted the timescales around a little bit. Um, I'm going to do a full video at some point about predictions. There'll probably be more than one video about predictions for the winds of winter and, and uh, a dream of spring now we've had to the show. Uh, but that's all as an outline that I, I very much agree, Jay. I think I, I, I'm thinking along the same lines as, uh, as you. Um, incidentally, just on the, the Valencar thing with the Maggie the Frog prophecies, because the Valencar prophecy was part of the Maggie the Frog prophecies, the way the show did it was that they showed how uh, Cersei fixated on this idea that there would be a, a, another younger, more beautiful woman to, to cast her off her throne and fixated on Marjorie. And that was how they showed that uh, sort of dynamic working rather than the Valencar bit, which they cut out from the show. They, yeah, completely cut the Valencar out. So nobody, uh, a lot of just show only watchers have no idea what the Valencar actually is or the theory that uh, runs along with it because there's several uh, people that, candidates, I suppose, for who could be the Valencar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and the Valencar obviously is actually a brick um, on the show. Um, so, was, <laughs> and it was the younger brick. We did get the confirmation from Set. In case you were wondering, it was the younger brick of a much older brick. <laughs> nice, like it a lot. Um, uh, I was so fine th over on Patreon. Thank you. Saying off topic, but how are you doing with the video about why everyone fought at the Tower of Joy? I'm dying to know why you think they did considering their goals and wishes should have been aligned. Uh, yeah, I'm very nearly finished. I know I've said this for a while. Uh, I, I dug out my script for that again, actually, literally today. I've It's going to be a long one, which is the, the, the reason why it's been taking a while, as well as obviously having season eight. Uh, but my video on why is it that Ned and his men fought against the King's Guard at the Tower of Joy when seemingly their, um, their objectives were the same, um, that video, uh, I will. I'm aiming to get out in the next week or two. Uh, no promises, but that's the aim. I, I think I should be able to finish writing it quite soon, and then it's just a matter of sort of recording it and getting all the pictures and gubbins done. So, uh, yeah, I'm nearly there, um, and hopefully, I will have an answer for you soon. Um, uh, Andrew K uh, is asking whether we put any significance on George R. R. Martin referring to Fagon as Aegon the Sixth a few times um, on, on his blog after the the season finished. Uh, talking about Winds of Winter, I mean, my take on that maybe uh, J R. As the question is to you, you'll have a different one. My take is I think he's just trolling us. Um, that is how. Fagon would refer to himself uh, rather than um, anything else. But do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think he is trolling us. Uh, George George likes to have fun. He's a fanboy. He he sort of does this thing with the fandom, and he plays with our emotions a little bit, doesn't he? Um, I, I think it is just a play. He's having some fun. He's having a go at us. Um, I don't think it's actually – because here's the deal. You would actually have to be – there would have to be a coronation ceremony in order to be the sixth year name. You, even if you declare yourself as the sixth year name, if it's not recorded by maesters and if it's sort of not done through the proper channels and process, right, it didn't happen. Uh, there's a history of this throughout Fire and Blood of people's names being completely struck from the record at the king's request. Um, Queen, what was it? Queen Renera comes to mind. Was that who was struck mm -hmm. from the record? Uh, yeah. at the at the behest of um, the king. So it, it sort of happens all the time, right? And so you can get struck from the records, and if the maesters don't record it, then it never happened. Yeah. Uh, so his, basically, history is written by the winners. It is, is the, go, the exactly. Or, 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 by, is. or the, by the ones that support it the most, right? Because the maesters are really pro-Targaryen in everything that they write. It does not matter. Even into Robert's reign and into Joffrey's reign, it is clearly written from a pro-Targaryen standpoint. Yeah. It, well, well, yeah, certainly. So Fire and Blood certainly seems to be there. Uh, um, uh, so the Maester who writes that is is very much a Jaehaerys fanboy all the way through. Some of the stuff is is um, uh, near laughable. The the kinds of things that were um, uh, that were written in that, 
um, in terms of quite how wonderful he is. Um, you could have spun it a completely different way and made him look like a terrible person um, if you'd want to, wanted to, but he clearly was uh, writing this fake history um, uh, in a way that uh, put the Targaryens in a good light. Uh, just on a technical matter, Mod Mary one saying, is Fagon a younger brother? Well, sort of. So he is the eldest son um, uh, of uh, Rhaegar, uh, but he is the second child, if he is who he claims to be. Uh, this is so, uh, yes, he is a younger brother of, of a, a dead elder sister, uh, but he is the eldest uh, remaining child, if, if if he is, as I say, who he claims to be. Um, let's talk about uh, Tyrion. Um, we've got a question from... Oh, actually, just before we get on to Tyrion, I just, uh, we had a super chat from anime lover Nicole, thank you very much, saying, how will Marcella and Tommen die? Maybe Darkstar poisons his weapon when he cut her off her ear. Her ear. Uh, heard somewhere that Darkstar um, was Oberyn's son, so revenge. What do, what do you reckon in terms of Marcella and Tom? And you were you're right in saying that they're alive and well in the books. Do you think that they will die in the same ways uh, on the sorry uh, in the books as they died in on the show? I uh, no, I think Marcella will die of poison. That that part uh, I'm pretty certain is going to happen. And animated lover Nicole, who's a patron of both of our channels, so thank you for donating on here as well. Um, I I I do think the Dark Star had something to do with that. It is, I think it's going to be a slower acting poison. Uh, but yes, so that she will ultimately succumb to the poisoning. Yeah, and I I think I'd agree with that. I think that so. Uh, it's going to be, it kind of makes sense that she dies on her return home, having been uh, brought out from the, uh, from Dawn. Um, Dawn will have a much bigger role in the books than oh, they do massive. in the show. So uh, they, are, they are on a number of different plays at the moment, and I think that they will end up um, supporting Fagon. Um, so Darkstar, who we're talking about, he is a uh, uh, sort of this rather flamboyant, if, if rather dark and sinister uh, character, who is sort of an offshoot from the uh, the House Dane um, of Arthur Dane um, and Ashara Dane uh, sort of fame, uh, and he is almost certainly, I think, going to try and claim the Sword Dawn for himself. And I suspect end up finding himself in the King's Guard of this new uh, Fagon, uh, Aegon the Sixth, as he claims to be. I think that is where his character arc is going to be going, and I think Dawn will throw them in themselves in behind there. But they didn't have any of the Fagon Aegon stuff going happening on the show, so that's why the whole Dawnish plot seemed a little bit off. Um, but what Vanessa, do you think? Yeah, go on. But uh, Vanessa Amnesty asked a really good question. Shouldn't Marcella be crowned before dying? Uh, great question, and here's kind of the the crux of it. Because she is in Dorne, Dorne actually never bowed to the dragons. So that's why we have Prince uh, Dorian Martell. That's why we have Prince Oberyn Martell. That's why we have um, princesses. So in a sense, she is crowned already because she is a princess. Uh, Ariana Martell and, and other book characters, right? Because anybody from Dorne who's in the Martell family is a prince or a princess of Dorne. So they have a crown and they have a title-ish. And that's where the crowning comes from. And so it, it does fit in, in the story. But because they never uh, bowed, bent, or were broken into submission to the dragon, that's the reason that they're referred to in such a manner. They were married into the Seven Kingdoms, ultimately. Yeah, they were, and so they, uh, yeah, as as you say, they're sort of treated in a different way. Uh, they were allowed to keep their titles uh, and all the rest of it. So um, that this was something that they sort of come up with a few times in sort of saying whether or not they should be marrying people. And um, with Elia Martel, the, the the line was always when she already was a princess before she got married to uh, to Rhaegar so it wasn't that she was taking some kind of like great step up in 
uh, rank on mobility from the Dornish perspective. So that's that's where they were coming from. But what do you think about Tommen? Do you think Tommen's going to uh, commit suicide? Oh, is he gonna is he gonna try to see if he can do a, a superhero landing on King's Landing? <laughs> no, I I don't know how Tommen's gonna go out in the books. I, I kind of throw all the way. I, I I throw a lot of positions around with that one, and I just don't know that I. I, I really hope he he gets goes out valiantly trying to save his queen, right? I I really hope that the the Rainbow Guard or the the Faith Militant. I hope that he dies trying to get to Marjorie. I I don't know. It's just I would I would think that's a little bit more romantic for the tales and for poor you know eight year old Toman in the books. Yeah, he is still young. Let, let's not forget this. And I think that. Um, it's entirely possible. I mean, I think he will die. Uh, I, it's entirely possible that he will commit suicide um, if if Cersei goes down the same sort of path which she seems inevitably to be going down in the books. Then at some point, if he sees uh, her uh, killing those that he cares about, Yes, he might well uh, go down that dark path. I think it's slightly too soon to say exactly what's going to happen with Tommen, uh, to be honest. But um, yeah, it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility, though we do have to remember he is still just a child. Um, we had a, another super chat. I'll just quickly find it from uh, Donna Daly. Uh, thank you very much. Saying many people seem to talk about Tywin as though he is a psychopath. While I do think that he was Machiavellian, I don't think he was without morals. Yeah, yeah I think this is this is an interesting one because I think we sort of bandy around these kind of psychological labels on characters quite a lot. I think he would think he had morals. I think that he would think that what he was doing was uh, to help serve and protect his family, and that was the highest calling, and therefore he was merely doing what was the right thing for him and his family. The question is whether that, because he clearly doesn't seem to care about anybody else, whether that makes him a psychopath. I think it's it's easy to throw around these kind of uh, labels. He clearly was Machiavellian. Uh, he clearly uh, was uncaring about people I, at the very Yeah, I, I would classify Tywin more as a utilitarian. Yeah, I, I, I don't think he's a, a psychopath. Because he cares about something beyond himself, which is kind of, you know, it's psychopathy kind of goes down a, a narcissistic vein or has a tendency to. Uh, I, I think he's more utilitarian because he does care about the family name and, and what goes on and how we carry on as a family. Because that's what's going to be left for generations, right? We're all going to be dead and gone. He makes notice of it multiple times. Uh, so I, I think that's really the, the most important thing there is to differentiate between the two is that he's more of a utilitarian uh and he does care about posterity so it does matter to him ultimately yeah i, th I think i would go with sort of pragmatist real politic um i mean utilitarian for me is more about the the greatest good for the greatest number um which i don't think was where he was about uh, what he was about i think he was trying to look after himself and his family i think you're right in the psychopath idea is very much focused in on the self rather than a greater ideal and he certainly did seem to have some kind of greater ideal it's that that was the thing that he built up as being more important than anything else and that he passed on to cersei uh, very strong. right the worst parts of himself right it ended up yeah. being part of the twins or at least one of the twins jamie is a little bit more self-sacrificing always has been uh doing his duty in that manner i, I think it really makes sense that um uh, jamie is the way he is and especially when he's separated from cersei a lot that's where you get the best jamie stories and that's what i love so much just random question robert do you have our side chat open um i do but i have okay. not been looking at it i will I have a quick uh look no I've, I've been throwing the uh super chats over there so i was just wondering if you knew that so you didn't have to scroll for them uh, yeah so i've got yeah i've got them got it thank you um yeah lots of talk about the different in the chat today about the difference between sociopaths and psychopaths i will hold my hands up and say i'm i'm not a psychologist so uh, i would highly recommend that you uh, go and um 
uh, that, that, I think Gemma did a video about this. I mean, she's not a professional psychologist either, but I, I know that she did quite a little bit of research into all of this. So um, she, she did, and actually, we have a panel at Con of Thrones that's going to be covering PTSD in Westeros, which it, it dabbles a little bit in this, but not a, a lot. We try to stick to the PTSD side of it, but this does come up. Uh, mental illness in Westeros was a live stream that we did on Gemma's channel, and she had done a previous video on it as well. So go and check that out. There's there's plenty of stuff in there. Excellent. We are about to talk about Tyrion, though. Uh, so uh, let's. Uh, Maura Lee says Tyrion is one of my favourite characters. Uh, what do you see will be his role in the books moving forward? Um, will he end up uh, as he did on the show as Hand of the King um, or something else? What do you reckon to that, Jr? Where, where do you think that his his arc is going to be roughly the same? I, I think roughly it'll be the same that I, I think he will end up in Westeros again. And I think he will be the hand of somebody, whether it's specifically Daenerys or not, we will see. I think that's kind of the, the what they're going to go for. I don't think some stuff was too far off in season eight. And that's one of them. I think that that will transpire. That will come to fruition. But I, uh, I don't think he's going to, he may or may not be in prison. I don't think Varys is going to die that way that he did. Um, I, I think there's going to be a lot more going into it. I mean, that's kind of a easy thing to say because of course there's going to be a lot more going into it. George R. R. Martin. So we shall see, but I, I think that'll follow somewhat of the same story arc that it, it'll be loose, loose, but the parts of it will be in there. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think that Tyrion is definitely going to be darker. A couple of people in the chat are talking about it. Be, it will be darker, I'm absolutely sure. But Tyrion in the books is a lot darker as a character, capable of a lot more uh, than uh, the character we saw in the show. Incidentally, with Varys, I think that his end might be the same. Not The build-up might be different, but he's very much throwing his lot in behind uh, Fagon, Aegon the Sixth, and I think that mm -hmm. uh, being killed by Danny uh, and Drogon is entirely feasible as, a, as an ending for him. Um, but yeah, Tyrion, I think he is currently in the books outside Marine, and yes. almost Armor certainly Armor he's he's armoring up for battle, which is the greatest like cliffhanger ever. So he's hanging out with Penny. The other dwarf, Jorah Mormont, uh, who's just recently been free to slave, in the, even though he's now branded and tattooed uh, with the flame, uh, which means he's an unruly slave. Uh, and they they signed over <laughs> with Brown Ble Brown Ben Plum. Wow, that was a mouthful. I don't know how I stuttered that out. Anyway, uh, and the second son, no, not second sons. Uh, which Salesforce company is that? Um, now I can't think of it. This is all off the top of my head. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm having a somebody will let us know in the chat. I can't, I can't think about it. Um, but yeah, so they're getting armored up right now for battle and they have no idea what's going on inside a Marine and everything is just going into utter chaos at the moment for, for Tyrion in the books. Yeah. So the, the pre-release chapters from the Winds of Winter seem to suggest that, that, uh, they are, his, his group are there actually trying to figure out who's going to win. Um, and then they'll throw in their lot with the winning side. And it is a very complicated battle that is about to happen uh, because there's a, uh, there's a siege going on. Uh, Barristan Selmy has led a, um, a charge out from the walls of Marine. Uh, there is um, an outbreak of uh, um, disease which is uh, devastating people inside and outside the city. And we have Victarion arriving with a force of Ironborn and Dragonbinder, this horn that allegedly, allegedly will be able to allow him to control dragons. There is so much going on. It's a very complicated uh, situation. But I think we will end up in the same situation that Tyrion is going to end up in Meereen and as part of Danny's inner council as they head over uh, to Westeros. So I think that is the way that that's all going to uh, sort of wrap up. And uh, then he will probably find himself in a position close to being Hand of the Queen to her. Whether he ends up as Hand to the Hand of the King at the very, very end, I, you know, I think it's reasonably, reasonably likely. 
I have to say. I mean, it's uh, the the one thing we know about the endings of the of the show is that George R. R. Martin did sit down for several days with the showrunners and tell them what it, you know, what the major beats of this were going to be, what was going to happen to the major characters. Now that doesn't mean that the endings are going to be exactly the same. I don't think it's a great guessing game. Uh, but I think that a lot of the things that we see are going to be the same. So John killing Danny, I think, will be the same. Danny burning King's Landing will be the same. I think Jamie and Cersei will die together. Um, and I think that Tyrion may well end up in a position of power, having gone through a very dark journey and not necessarily being a better person at the end of it, but certainly a more... Uh, scarred and broken person and I think that is something that they tried to show on the show the fact that he was broken by his time in prison and had lots of time to think and all the rest of it uh, but I think that he will be more broken by his journey in the books if that makes sense um we did have one other question well I've only got I think a couple more <coughs> Pardon me, a couple more questions from my patrons. So now is uh, the time for you to drop any other questions in the chat. Uh, I reckon we'll probably go for about another 10, 15 minutes. Um, uh, Wonder Dog or 26 Art Girl says, did you see the ending to Tyrion's joke in the Irish press? It was hilarious. Now, uh, JR, you strike me as the kind of man who can tell a good joke. Um, did you did, did you uh, did you hear the ending to this? I don't think it's ever been officially confirmed, but I do know that there is a a generally accepted um, ending to Tyrion's story about the once entering a, a brothel with a uh, an, an ass and a honeycomb. Yes, I, I saw that one, which is funny because I had been basically saying the same thing for a very long time. So it's nice to see it. Uh, kind of coming around uh are we gonna have uh a go of this joke or are we gonna i I, to... I would love you to off the top of your head uh re re give us the joke okay so that the joke goes basically something like this he walks in uh, Tyrion walks in or a man walks in as the joke goes a man walks into the brothel with a jackass and a honeycomb and the brothel keeper asks him well why do you have uh uh jackass and a honeycomb why have you brought them in here and he says well my wife uh got a genie in a bottle and three wishes and first she wished for the finest ass in all the land and poof i got this this jackass and then her second wish was for her to have uh, a home fit for a queen and then poof uh he ended up with the honeycomb and then the befuddled brothel keeper looks and asks well what about the third wish and he said well she wished that i had a cock that hung down to my knees uh and brothel keeper thinks well that's not so bad and Tyrion gets all offended and says not so bad i used to be six four a bump <laughs> <laughs> it's i like it I, it's a good and i think it first came from somebody on reddit so unknown person on reddit uh well done i, I love that one uh uh magic trip saying i've heard jr tell this joke so many times now um yeah i've, I've heard him tell it before as well which is why i asked him to say it <laughs> might have been a little pre-planning on that one a little bit of setup <laughs> excellent um okay so um let's go to my final uh well, it's not really a question but uh maura lee is asking about uh, the ending of the Song of Ice and Fire series may be like the scouring of the Shire in the end of the Lord of the Rings series. Um, would you elaborate uh, on a, on that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, you asked whether, you know, if, if I was a writer, how I would conclude it. I think I wouldn't put myself in George R. R. Martin's shoes. I think he's the only person who could end this. But uh, he has talked about the ending being having the same feel as the scouring of the Shire. And the Scouring of the Shire is the penultimate chapter in The Lord of the Rings. And in that chapter, basically, we have the hobbits having returned back home, discover that all is not beautiful and well and wonderful in the Shire as they had hoped. They, they've gone out, they've fought the good fight, 
they have been changed as people and they have arrived back home, but there is still one more battle to fight. And so they defeat the evil in their own homeland um, uh, and only then can they start again to to enjoy the fruits of, of all of their labours and actually try and build for the future. So that is what the feel of the scouring of the Shire is, and that is what George R. R. Martin has said he wants the feel of the last or the ending of A Song of Ice and Fire to be, which I interpret as meaning that once all of the big battles have happened, once the great threat from... Uh, the army of the dead and all the rest of it has been dealt with, people will then return and we'll have this like second bit. It, some people felt that, you know, getting rid of the, the army of the dead so early in season eight was uh, w- was a little bit weird. Uh, I think this is actually the way George R. R. Martin is going to structure it, is that you get rid of the big baddie uh, and then you have the, well, what's left? Well, we can't relax just yet because we've still got Cersei to deal with. So that is the kind of the feel that we've got, is that our war-weary heroes, having uh, done what they had to do, uh, have this one final, apparently lesser threat to be dealing with um, before they can build afresh. So that is what uh, the the scouring of the Shire feel is and how I think it will apply to Sung of Ice and Fire. Um, we've had a couple of super chats very quickly saying uh, from a friendly neighborhood nitpicker, which is a great name. Uh, thank you very much. Saying, could the Valonqar be a brother of the faith? Uh, yeah, so Valonqar literally translated from High Valyrian is little brother. Uh, yeah, it could, I think. And I think that um, the, the whole point about Valonqar is it is general, it is vague. We do not know that it's. Uh, Cersei clearly interprets it in one way, but the whole point is that it could be in any number of, you know, a dozen or more different ways it could be interpreted. Um, we've talked before about the idea that maybe it could mean little sister, not just little brother, not necessarily her little brother, somebody else's little brother. Yes, perhaps a brother of the faith. This kind of thing, there are lots of different ways you can interpret it, and it is one of those bits of prophecy that you can only um you'll only really understand right after it's happened is 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 my uh, interpretation of that so yes that's entirely possible and donna daly uh, thank you very much five pounds saying do you think the castly rock lannisters survive if not do the lannisport lannisters take over or some other family uh yes yeah, so this is a question so the Casterly Rock Lannisters is the main house Lannister. Um, now on the show, they kind of had a sort of a, a smaller version of, of house Lannister with just like people like Tywin and Cersei and all the rest of it. But uh, there are a lot more cousins in uh, in the books. So the family tree is a lot larger. And there is an offshoot called the Lannisport Lannisters who are sort of like um uh, a cadet branch of the the family um, i mean my take jr i'll take i'll take your thoughts on this just a second mike is that um it there, there are two bits here first of all whether house lannister as a whole will be allowed to stay in power as a as a sort of a concept uh, after it all um and secondly um, if they are, there will always be a next person in line. That's just the way that this works. It's not so much uh, um, uh, the fact that you can easily wipe out every single living person who could ever possibly claim to be a Lannister. That they will, they will know who, uh, with the English royal family, they will know who the twelfth, eighteenth, twenty seventh, fifty sixth person in line to the throne is. With the Lannisters, theoretically, they will also know who. Uh, all the different people in line uh, if if a huge amount of them die but what what do you what do you think do you think house Lannister as a whole will survive i I think Tyrion will survive certainly uh Jamie questionable uh, I think he is expendable Cersei is certainly gonna die so really it comes down to Jamie and Tyrion as being the possible survivors and what what 
or how George R. R. Martin chooses to handle that obviously remains to be seen. I, I would say that they do survive, but uh, like to your point, the Lannisters uh, of Lannisport, or th there's several cadet branches, and the Lannisters of Lannisport are are think of them like the Car Starks, right? They, they were at one point in time a House Stark members. They became a cadet branch, and then they developed into their own family in existence with the the main family of the Lannisters, right? So, uh, I don't see them as being able to take over his power. They might end up being uh, Castellans for Castle Rock if Tyrion is going to remain in King's Landing as the hand of whomever that's going to be. Um, I'd really still like to see Davos on the throne, though. I'm just going to throw that out there. Let's see who won the three. I, uh, Davos, Davos, oh, Davos. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would, but I, I, I just because yeah, no reason. <laughs> I have absolutely no evidence for this. I just want it to happen. Uh, well, that's as a good enough reason as any. Um, Stephen Durant saying, uh, "Sorry to be off topic. Does Robert think that there will ever be a film or TV thing based on the Silmarillion, or is it really that dull?" Um, the the show that Amazon are developing at the moment, the, which is going to be the most expensive TV show in history, um, that is at the moment, as far as we know, uh, going to be based in the Second Age, which uh, is the Second Age of Middle Earth, which is um, uh, charted out at least partly in overview in the Silmarillion. So there, the, it's not that there's a um, that huge amounts there uh, but we do know some of the things that happen in that period that could well be covering for example the forging of the rings of power um, you could certainly make a good story out of that and uh, uh, secret sauron hiding and doing all sorts of stuff like that uh, there, there's a lot of good stuff in there um, and they definitely will be able to do it. my tolkien lord of the rings content uh, incidentally will be starting in september i'm really excited about it I'm rereading my way through Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and a couple of other things so that when we get to September, then I'll be uh, absolutely on top of my game for it. But that's when I'm starting my Black Mirror uh, coverage. Uh, I promised a couple of weeks ago, uh, I've just finished my video on my first Black Mirror video. That's going to be appearing, I think, on Saturday. Uh, so that's coming up. Um, the Well Told Tale is, again, I took a, a week or so off uh, just because life's been busy, um, that will be starting up and will be back into its regular weekly pattern as of next week as well. Um, I think that is probably it in terms of the questions. Uh, JR, is there anything you just wanted to add at the end, or do you want to remind people where they can find you on the internet? Uh, yes, you can always find me at uh, Geek Chat One on Facebook group. Uh, come and join the chat. We uh, talk about all sorts of geeky things, including what is up and coming on Amazon, what is going to be dropping on Netflix, uh, which is the Witcher series, which I just happen to be doing a book club for right now, starting with the first book, uh, The Last Wish of the Witcher series, which will wrap up about two months before the first episode drops on Netflix, which is December 20th. And that is in conjunction with Secrets of the Citadel. So Gemma and I have a book club going and that's uh, covering all sorts of things. We have uh, the Tales of Duncan Egg, the Hedge Knight uh, for Patreon exclusives, uh, The Witcher, and we are doing a World of Ice and Fire on her channel. So really always fun to have those conversations. And of course, those chats are going on in Geek Chat 1 and we are doing episodes on that weekly. So be looking forward to that. Excellent. And as I said, I would highly recommend um, uh, you, uh, you go and check out Geek Chat 1. Uh, Donald Peoples, thank you so much. Just spotted the Super Chat coming through saying, always a pleasure, Robert. Great to see you, JR. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic having you on, uh, JR. Um, I always say this, um, uh, guys, I cannot do this without the support of my patrons. It is what uh, uh, frees me up and allows me to be dedicating the time that I do to this. So, uh, patrons, thank you. Um, and uh, if you are at all interested in supporting the channel uh, or if you want access to some exclusive benefits for patrons like getting your uh, priority for your questions answered on live streams or uh, access to um, my audio narrations from the pre-release chapters of the Winds of Winter, that kind of stuff, uh, there will be a link appearing hopefully up here somewhere um, after the, if you're watching this back later. If you're at all interested in uh, at other live streams that I've done with other content creators, there will be a link appearing up here somewhere to the playlist. Uh, okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you again, JR. Thank you to the chat. 
particular thanks to everyone with the super chats. Um, I will see you again same time next week. Take care.